beliefs about ourselves and our expectations of ourselves influence our perception of the world. And I would go even further to say they not only influence our perception of the world, they define the world in which we subjectively inhabit. One way for an average person to to reflect about this, and this is a kind of simple meditation exercise that we do, is imagine a challenging situation that has happened recently in your life. Bring it into your mind and simply envision what your response to that situation might be if you had a completely different set of beliefs and expectations going into that situation. We are so fused with the beliefs and expectations that we have of ourselves, many people don't even recognize that they have beliefs and expectations. Wait, can, can we just, can we slow this down just for a second? Because, so I thought of a situation, I'm not gonna go into too much detail. I thought of a situation where someone hurt my feelings and they did something that I think is wrong, you know, uh, unethical, like really wrong. So I'm trying to imagine, like, I have, I'm thinking of a friend of mine who happens to be a, a, I would consider a pretty enlightened person. She was raised in a Buddhist community and she's very chill. If this happened to her, she would have had a totally different reaction. I mean, it's not to say that she wouldn't be hurt, but is is that the kind of example we're talking about? Yeah, that that's a, I think that's a very appropriate example. Huh. We all have a narrative about ourselves. Um, many people don't recognize that they have a narrative. And there are some people that recognize that they have a narrative, but they regard it as a kind of fixed quality of themselves. They don't recognize that the narrative can shift. And really what's key to well-being is not so much changing the narrative at the beginning, but it's changing our relationship to the narrative so that we can see the narrative for what it is that it, it is a narrative. And it could be different. Uh, and uh, it, it's a constellation of thoughts. And thoughts are thoughts. They're ephemeral. They come and go. It's my and Bialik's breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. Because you know she knows a thing or two. And now she's going to break down. It's a breakdown. She's going to break it down. Hi, I'm Maya Bialik, and welcome to my breakdown. This is the place where we break things down so you don't have to. Today, we're going to break down so many different aspects of not just meditation, but what it truly means to be well in your emotional self. Uh, flying solo today, which is really sad because Jonathan would absolutely love to talk to Dr. Richard Davidson. He is a professor of psychology and psychiatry and founder and director of the Center for Healthy Minds at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. But he is so dope in so many ways, he began his personal meditation journey with none other than Ram Das when he was in grad school in the 70s. He's published over 573 articles. He's written a book, The Emotional Life of Your Brain, uh, with Sharon Begley. He wrote with Daniel Goleman, Altered Traits, which came out in 2017. He founded a nonprofit, Healthy Minds Innovations, which translates science into tools that cultivate and measure well-being. I highly recommend you go to centerhealthyminds.org. There's also an app, a Healthy Minds app that is free, which is unbelievable. And this man is all about us understanding the larger framework of our wellness, where awareness, connection, insight, and purpose contribute to our well-being. He's a fascinating, really, really, really well-researched man. And he has studied over 75 monks in an MRI scanner. Do I need to say more? If you want to know about the science of meditation and also the larger framework in which we as humans deserve to connect with meditation as one of our tools, I highly recommend you take a listen. It's such a pleasure to welcome Dr. Richie Davidson, he goes by Richie, to The Breakdown. Thank you so much for having me. Happy to be here. You said I can call you Richie, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. <laughs> Please do. 
I tend to be pretty old fashioned with neuroscientists and I feel like I should call them doctor. <laughs> but if you insist, I will call you Richie. I um, insist. <laughs> thank you so much um, for for being here. I'm very, very excited to to speak with you. Um, you know, you, you're one of the the real kind of pioneers, you know, in an aspect of of neuroscience, which obviously is very close to my heart, um, but also our understanding of of meditation and of mindfulness. And one of my sort of favorite things um, about you is um, you you're very careful in sort of not um, not equating all ways that meditation and mindfulness have made their way into our culture. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit, because, you know, we obviously talk about it a lot here on the podcast. Um, I've talked about how my meditation practice has has grown and is still growing. Um, can you sort of talk about, and I'm not, I don't mean to start this off by asking you to be critical, but can you talk a little bit about what certain aspects of our culture, what we're getting wrong or not exactly right when we talk about, let's just say, meditation? Sure. Well, first, thank you for having me, and thank you for the good question. And I think a good place for us to begin is to acknowledge first that uh, there are hundreds of different kinds of meditation. Uh, I often uh, use the analogy of sports. Uh, there are just a plethora of different kinds of sports. Uh, and, and to say sports would really be so underspecified in tel- terms of describing what a person might be doing. And in the same way, uh, uh, really, uh, in terms of the contemplative traditions from which they come, there are literally hundreds of different kinds of meditation practices. Here in the West, um, we have privileged just a very tiny fraction, and there's even uh, a further restriction of range in terms of what's been studied scientifically. And often uh, meditation is uh, equated with mindfulness, uh, and mindfulness is one of hundreds of kinds of meditation. Uh, and, um, uh, and so, uh, and it's also the case, and this is a separate issue, that these practices in their original form have been embedded in a larger framework, uh, a part of which is an ethical framework. And when these practices are taught in the West, and also when they're being studied, for the most part, um, when they're being studied scientifically in the West, they are stripped of this ethical framework, this ethical context in which they are embedded in their original form. And um, I think that this does some disservice to the practices themselves. Uh, I believe that uh, a a proper contextualizing of these practices within their context may actually even change the effects that they have, both behaviorally and biologically. Uh, And so... um, uh, I think that uh, these are all elements that um, uh, are complex elements, but ones that really are important in understanding um, uh, how these practices affect the mind, brain, and the body. Can you, um, it, it's it's a, a beautiful point. And, you know, we had Sharon Salzberg on here, and we've had, you know, a lot of really interesting people who were part of some of those early waves, you know, of 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 bringing, as it were, bringing uh, meditation and and you know Eastern practices that have been in use for thousands of years. You're right in a completely different context. You know, bringing those to the West. Um, can can you even be a little bit more specific? Because I think when people hear you know like ethical construct, like can, can you be more specific? Like, is it just that white people in the West shouldn't meditate? No. So can can you be more specific? Specific about kind of what that means. I mean, what I hear is like when I say that I practice yoga, right? People picture me like sweating in a room with lots of skinny, pretty girls because I live in Los Angeles and, you know, like you feel good and you get real strong. And, you know, when when I think about yoga, I think about all the branches of it and I think about mantras and I think about positioning and I think about breath work and I think about mindfulness 
because that's sort of how I've been taught to think about it. Is it similar for meditation? Yeah, it's similar in some ways. Uh, I think one of the um, important pieces is that in their original context, you know, when we put our butts on the cushion, it's primarily not about us. It's about others. We, mm. we are putting our butts on the cushion in order for us to be uh, more compassionate, in order for us to be more helpful to others, mm. uh, in order to uh, uh, increase our warm heartedness toward others. It's really about um, uh, uh, that altruistic frame. That is uh, uh, the the kind of um, mindset, if you will, in a, using a, a more modern term mm. that uh, these practices are really part of. Uh, and so in the West, they've become much more self-focused. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, it's really focused on self-improvement, peak performance. I was going to say, there's a competitive notion. You call it this sort of like mind training, you know, like who, who can get there quickest? Who can be Zen the quickest? Yeah. And so I think that it's, um, uh, again, uh, uh, the, we haven't, we meaning the scientific community has not yet uh, adequately studied this, but my conviction from everything I know as a scientist and as a practitioner, that when we meditate, even with simple forms of mindfulness practice, and we meditate uh, with this altruistic mindset, the impact of the practice is going to be different mm -hmm. than when it is removed, uh, stripped from that context. And you specifically, you know, have kind of dedicated your, your career to sort of providing both parts of an, an understanding of what it means to sort of apply meditation meaning there's the, you know, the neurological substrates kind of part of your universe and, and your work. Um, and then there's there's also, you know, sort of um, an elucidation of what it really means to sort of have emotional health and what well-being means. So you, you kind of have these, these two things which you know, for anyone to work on one of those things would be such an amazing contribution, but you really have kind of a hand in in both of these. So, um, you know, as Sharon Salzberg said, you know, she didn't need to know the neural substrates to know, you know, that this stuff works. But um, for, for many people, and I think also in general for Western culture, we really want that that information and we want those scans and we want the data and we want, you know, we want the asterisks indicating statistical significance. So um, if you don't mind kind of giving us a layperson's sort of, um, you know, if I, if I were to say to you, I'd like you to convince people, you know, in, in four minutes or less that meditation, mindfulness, that this kind of attention to, to, to breath work, to, um, to silence, to calm, to peace, that it impacts your brain positively. What what would you say? Yeah. Well, first, let me say that I, um, first of all, Sharon is a very dear old friend, and I would agree with her uh, that, you know, and for me, you know, I, I didn't originally start meditating because I was convinced by the scientific research. When I started meditating, there was no scientific research. <laughs> um uh, so, uh, it was so long uh, it, ago, there wasn't even science. Am I right? It, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> well, there wasn't science on meditation. <laughs> there were, there were, there were three papers in the world's literature on, uh, neuroscientific changes with meditation. That wow. was it. And, um, yeah, my first retreat was in 1974. Hmm. So, uh, it really was before any of this work was, uh, started. Um, but to answer your question, there are a few things that I would say. Uh, um, we have learned that meditation, uh, and here I'm intentionally using it generically because different forms of meditation do different things to the mind and the brain. They're not all the same. But if we make a general point about a variety of different kinds of meditation, uh, we know that uh, they improve our brain health and they improve our bodily health. 
Uh, and this is one of the ways in which they are they support well-being. Uh, and so uh, uh, there is research that shows that circuits in the brain change in response to a variety of different kinds of meditation. And these circuits are important for uh, several different aspects of well-being. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, one of the things that I liken it to is, um, which doesn't directly answer your question, but is indirectly related, and that is that um, I think of the cultivation of well-being as a public health issue. We know that meditation improves well-being. We know that well-being is linked to our health. Um, uh, people who have higher levels of well-being are physically healthier. Mm. That's not true of everyone. But if you look at large populations, epidemiological research, uh, it's definitely true. Uh, and so... Uh, when human beings first evolved on this planet, none of us were brushing our teeth. And I'll bet every person listening to this podcast brushes their teeth and spends a few minutes a day doing that. This is not part of our genome. Mm. This is something that we figured out how to do because it's important for our personal physical hygiene. What we're talking about is important for our personal mental hygiene. And it turns out that science shows that our mental hygiene is also linked to our physical hygiene. My Meal Alex Breakdown is supported by AG1. I drink AG1, the daily foundational nutritional supplement that supports whole body health literally daily. I gave AG1 a try because I wanted better gut health and more energy, and I wanted a supplement that actually tastes great. I drink AG1 in the morning before starting my day, and I know that I'm doing something good for my body right off the bat. AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that delivers comprehensive nutrients for whole body health. It can replace your multivitamin, probiotic, and more in one simple drinkable habit. AG1 has a science-driven formulation of vitamins, probiotics, and whole food source nutrients. It's raising the standard for quality in the supplement category and helps you build your health foundation first. AG1 was created in 2010 and has helped millions of mornings begin on a healthier foundation ever since. It's not only a high-quality all-in-one solution for daily foundational nutrition, it also saves you time, confusion, and money. Each serving costs less than $3 a day and gives you powerful long-term results. If you're looking for a simpler, effective investment for your health, try AG1 and get five free AG1 travel packs and a free one-year supply of vitamin D with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash breakdown. That's drinkag1.com slash breakdown. Check it out. My Ambiolics Breakdown is supported by Stitch Fix. Wouldn't it be great if you had the perfect wardrobe to match your evolving lifestyle? Whether you're picking up a new activity, looking for maternity wear, or maybe you're just bored of your old choices, the stylists at Stitch Fix make sure you always have something to wear. Stitch Fix is the best way to shop new styles and brands. Think of them as your personal style partner. Your stylist will learn about your tastes and collaborate with you on looks you'll love without breaking the bank. You simply share your style, sizes, and budget with a quick style quiz, and Stitch Fix will send you five items in a fix right to your door. With your choices in mind and sizes from extra small to triple XL, they will find your perfect fit. The best part is you try everything on at home, keep what you like, and send back the rest. Shipping and returns are always free. They have over 1,000 brands and styles. No matter what season of life you're in, Stitch Fix has you covered. You can order a refresh as needed or set it and forget it with regular fixes. You are in control. Over time, Stitch Fix and their seasoned style experts will match you with greater precision to perfect pieces for you based on your likes and dislikes. It is so easy. I recently wore my new Stitch Fix dress to synagogue, and I got so many compliments. Even my kids liked it. It was something I never would have even known existed. And I filled out the brief questionnaire and then I did like a couple of the quizzes so that they could learn my style. It worked. A big thank you to Stitch Fix. You guys get me and they'll get you too. Try today at stitchfix.com slash break and you'll get 25% off when you keep everything in your fix, which you probably will. That's stitchfix.com slash break, stitchfix.com slash break. When you study brains of people and you do these kind of, you know, large, you know, meditation studies and, you know, there's many different methods that that you can use to, to do this. Um, how do you control for the other things that people do? Meaning people who meditate are 
also more likely to, you know, not eat processed foods, um, you know, uh, have jobs that tend to be less stressful, meaning like there are so many other things that, that you have to control for. You know, how do you how do you know that that's what you're looking at? Because I know a lot of people who meditate and they are not kind to their spouses. They're not kind to themselves. Or I know people who go to yoga and then leave and start cursing at people because, you know, they're not driving fast enough on the freeway. Or, you know, on an even more kind of, you know, basic level, like many people like still smoke cigarettes and drink alcohol, but also like meditate and do yoga. So how do you control for that? How do we know what we're looking at when you tell me, you know, this study shows? Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, it's a wonderful question. You also introduced some other elements to it, which are also really important about people who meditate that, um, you know, do all these other things that may seem inconsistent with their meditation practice. So let me address each of them. They're both important. Um, the first question about how do we know that it's really meditation as opposed to their diet, uh, uh, their um, uh, cho lifestyle choice of choice of occupation, uh, just a gazillion things. So, you know, when we started this work, we compared long-term meditators to age and gender match controls. And all of the problems that you're describing uh, are exactly the problems that leave that work um, to fundamentally be unsatisfying. Um, we needed to start there because if there was no difference between long-term meditators and age and gender match controls, we might as well put away the hardware and go home <laughs> uh, because uh, if we can't see a difference between them, with all the confounds that you're talking about, then we're not going to see uh, effects in more novice meditators. So we started there and we found some huge differences. There are many questions that uh, are uh, important and that can account for these differences. And we can't say with any certainty that these are due to the meditation practice. It could be living at high altitudes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it could be the simplicity of their lives. So many, so many factors. So we then embarked upon entirely different research strategies where we took people who've never meditated before mm -hmm. and we randomly assigned them to meditate. These are people who obviously are expressing some interest. And the way we set these experiments up is we tell them, we're going to teach you an intervention to cultivate well-being, but there'll be different interventions. And you'll be randomly assigned to one or another of these interventions. In one case, a person might get meditation. Another case, a person may get cognitive therapy, mm. which is an empirically well-validated strategy for reducing anxiety and depression and improving well-being. And people are randomly assigned, so they don't choose mm -hmm. which they're going to. Uh, and so all of these factors that you're talking about now are completely rigorously removed mm -hmm. from explanation in that case. And there we can much more definitively say that the changes we're seeing are due to meditation per se. That's, that's a, um, a really helpful um, set of distinctions. What's the most interesting part of the brain, in your opinion, that you find positively impacted by consistent <laughs> meditation? Yeah, I know it's, it's like asking uh, you to pick your favorite child, you know? Like. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> neuro, all neuroscientists have favorite parts of the brain that they're... Um, uh, so, uh, you know, I would say probably, well, one is, I, I should, I, I should first qualify it in the following way. We don't these days talk about, um, specific individual parts of the brain so much because that's not the way the brain works. Uh, the brain is a, uh, a massively interconnected, uh, set of, machinery and they the brain works in circuits it doesn't work in isolated structures having said all that having said all that things light up and you can tell what part of the brain it is <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh that's in part true uh, uh and so one part of the brain which is importantly influenced by meditation is the prefrontal cortex this chunk of real estate that we have 
uh, in the front of our brain that really in many scientists believe it is responsible for things that are um, characteristically human. Uh, it, uh, in particular, our capacity for self-control, uh, for regulating emotions, regulating attention, uh, all of which in part depend upon the prefrontal cortex. And so uh, there are literally hundreds of scientific studies now that show some effect on the prefrontal cortex from different kinds of meditation. Um, also can't help but wondering about prefrontal cortex and trauma. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of attention to this particular part of the brain in terms of um, the, the processing of trauma in, in terms of knowing what's now, what's then, and really a deep sense of self. Um, meditation also something that can be very helpful in, in trauma therapy as well, correct? Yeah. So one of the things I often say is that the very mechanisms in the brain and in the body that encode trauma uh, are the same mechanisms that can be used for awakening, mm. uh, for well-being. They're, they're mechanisms of neuroplasticity and epigenetics, uh, both of which are we, we know are impacted by trauma, uh, and both of which also we know now are uh, engaged and altered with different kinds of meditation. Mm -hmm. So um, there, there is no question, I think, that these practices can be helpful. Uh, in that regard. Um, but yeah, I want to also go back to uh, a point that you made earlier that we didn't, I didn't talk about yet, which is the, um, <laughs> the examples you gave of the person who comes out of mm -hmm. uh, a meditation class or yoga class and gets on the LA freeway and is um, behaving uh, uh, um, like a jerk to others who might be driving. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, certainly all of us have seen those kinds of examples. And to me, um, uh, I mean, it, it's not that surprising. We're going to see stuff like that because uh, it takes a lot to change habit. Uh, mm -hmm. And if a person has been habitually behaving in a certain way, uh, I think it's, um, uh, it's unrealistic to expect a magical solution uh, and for change to happen uh, so quickly. And so this is uh, really where we see the influence of practice and um, practice uh, uh, in a variety of, of scientific studies now uh, shows um, um, systematic relationships with outcome. Uh, not all the time, but in many studies, the more practice we do, the more beneficial is the outcome. Well, I'm going to go ahead and um, poke at that a little bit because I think, you know, as someone who took up, you know, meditation um, really at a time in my life when my behavior towards my children was an indicator that something was amiss in me, right? Um, and I have pretty, pretty uh, e easygoing children. And what became clear to me was that my my instinct to rush to anger or to rage uh, or to extreme impatience uh, was a complete reflection of me and really not them. You know, I, I do believe children um, do exactly what they need to get their needs met. And if you don't meet it the first time, if you don't listen, if you're on your phone, if you're doing other things, they will tug harder and then they will start doing other things to get attention. And, um, and it was a friend of mine, uh, Carla Naumberg, um, who um, who turned me on to, to meditation. But I I want to be really um, I want to be really consistent with the message that I know that that you are so good at sort of delivering as as part of your life's work. It's not simply that you need to put in the hours because many of us sit and we we put in hours. Um, there's there is a notion that there's an integration required to really incorporate not just, you know, the, the tricks, uh, the top five, you know, ways to meditate, but really a deeper understanding of the substrates of the need to, you know, fill in the word, center, uh, be mindful, quiet down, have more compassion, you know, live an ethical kind of existence. Um, and 
you know, for me, as I, as I was, you know, learning more and more about you, um, you know, this notion that awareness, connection, insight, and purpose are actually the, the framework for kind of who we are, um, to me, that makes a lot more sense. Um, and I, I know that that's, you know, obviously uh, part of what you're indicating. Um, there's there's a larger kind of path. Um, and I wonder if it's okay that I brought those four concepts in. Um, because t- to me, that's sort of, you know, that piece that for me was missing. You know, when I just started like sitting and like, okay, I'm sitting, like I don't get it. You know, um, it wasn't until... You know, and I, I came to these not necessarily from your work, but, um, you know, I came to the notion of starting to chip away at awareness, connection, insight, purpose. I, I call them ACIP, but I don't know if you call them ACIP or if it has ACIP. an acronym. Okay, ACIP. Great. Um, can can you talk a little bit about sort of those components um, and and perhaps how that sort of, you know, then dovetails into when we think about kind of growing, not just a practice of meditation, but sort of an identity of integrity. Yeah, well, that's beautifully put. Thank you for putting it that way. Um, The ASIP components that you're referring to, awareness, connection, insight, and purpose, uh, we uh, view as a framework, a template for understanding Mm well-being. These are the four key pillars, if you will. Uh, In each of these pillars, we um, believe exhibits plasticity. They can be changed by experience Mm. and they can also be influenced by training. And um, this framework is really important and guides uh, pretty much everything we do these days. Uh, And and we think it's particularly important because uh, uh, as we discussed earlier, most of the work in uh, science, in the science of meditation in the West, is focused on the first two pillars. Most of it is focused on the first pillar, awareness, which is where mindfulness would be. There's a little bit on connection Mm. um, uh, with loving kindness and compassion practices. Uh, There's virtually nothing on insight. Uh, And and while there is scientific research on purpose, Mm. there's almost no research uh, on the training of purpose in the way that we're talking about. Um, uh, uh, that is the plasticity of purpose. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and so uh, this is really an important framework. And, um, uh, you know, when when a person is just doing mindfulness, with all due respect, it would be like going to the gym and just working out on your upper body. You know, it's going to be good for your upper body, but after a while, it's actually going to lead to some imbalance. Mm. Uh, And so in order for a human being to flourish, she needs all these components. Um, It's not possible to flourish uh, with just one or two. We need all of them. Uh, And so uh, we have developed a more systematic well-being training program we don't call it a mindfulness program because that's not what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it incorporates all of these components, uh, and um, uh, we we not only do we believe, but we've shown that they're all trainable and uh, uh, they influence overall well-being. Biologics Breakdown is supported by Puree. There are so many headlines about contamination from heavy metals, pesticides, toxins, not just to the environment, but what we put in our bodies. That's why I was so thrilled to discover Puree, pure natural food supplements. I add their plant protein booster to my smoothies, and I highly recommend this brand. Protein is an essential part of any healthy diet, not just for athletes. And I had been looking for a high-quality vegan source that I could trust, and I found that with Puree's PB Plant Protein Booster. It offers 10 grams of high-quality pea protein isolate per scoop. Plus, it contains red algae that fortifies the product with an organic form of calcium, and it's certified clean by the Clean Label Project and won the Purity Award. Every batch is third-party tested against more than 200 contaminants, including heavy metals, pesticides, and glyphosate, all common concerns in plant-based protein products. 
I like the PB Plant Protein Booster in all of my smoothies. It is super delicious. It is not grainy at all. And the neutral flavor means it doesn't compete with everything else that I'm putting in my smoothies. And my kids drank it and didn't complain, which is the greatest seal of approval for me. Puree is pure origin, potency, and peace of mind. That's what we get with all of the wonderful products that Puree offers. Be aware of what you're putting in your body. Trust Puree like I do. Right now, Puree is offering our listeners 20% off site-wide. Go now to my special URL, Puree.com slash breakdown. Use the promo code breakdown. This even applies to the already discounted subscriptions. You'll get almost a third off the price. Go to P-U-O-R-I.com slash breakdown. Don't wait. Use the promo code breakdown at Puree.com slash breakdown. And now a word from our sponsors at Betterment. Picture this. Your eyes meet a mysterious stranger from across the room. Your souls start to intertwine, your hearts start to become one, and you haven't thought about your investing portfolio in a while. That's because you use Betterment. Betterment lets you be wildly, madly, deeply, totally chill about your finances. Their automated technology makes it easy and simple to get in the market and stay in the market without checking in every day. Gone are the days of being glued to your phone, tracking your portfolio's every move, and not being able to trust your money is where it should be. Thanks to Betterment's expertise, automated technology, and optimization tools, you can be the totally chill investor you've always wanted to be. Plus, Jonathan, you'll have more time too. You'll have more time to figure out the mysterious and alluring stranger from across the room who will surely drive you mad. Betterment. Be invested and totally chill. Learn more at Betterment.com. Investing involves risk. Performance is not guaranteed. You know, I'll be honest. I was surprised when, and, uh, you know, I read the the PNAS paper, um, and I was really surprised when, when you talked about how for awareness, for connection, for insight, and for purpose, that these things are able to be cultivated. They're able to be grown. The, the, the place you were born, the class you were born into, the family you were born into— that's not what determines your ability to develop these. And I found that I was surprised that I was surprised to, to hear that, but it it did make me feel very hopeful. Um, and I think the one that, that obviously, as you mentioned, doesn't really get a lot of attention, the one that I, I wonder if you can elaborate a little bit about, because I think it is the most abstract for, for most lay people, the notion of insight. So, Insight, this is a a quote from from the paper, insight in our framework refers to self-knowledge concerning the manner in which emotions, thoughts, beliefs, and other factors are shaping one's subjective experience, especially one's sense of self. I think eight out of 10 well-adjusted adults would be like, what's that? (laughs) Can you explain Explain what insight is. I would argue this is one of the things most missing from our current culture in every aspect. Yeah. And first, let me just say, I love that you asked this question. Uh, and, um, And it is also, if you look at other existing frameworks for understanding well-being, to the best of our knowledge, there's not a single other framework that has insight as part of it. Uh, it's it's really unique. Although in the contemplative traditions, if you look in Buddhist psychology, mm-hmm. it's all about insight. And if you talk to the Dalai Lama, um, you know that's the core of the meditation practice he does. It's really fundamentally about insight. Um, so what we mean by this is really pretty simple, and um, it is the idea that our beliefs and our expectations, particularly our beliefs about ourselves and our expectations of ourselves, influence our perception of the world. Mm. And I would go even further to say they not only influence our perception of the world, they define the world in which we subjectively inhabit. Mm. Um, uh, You know, William James eloquently spoke about this in in his writing. Um, uh, And... One way for an average person to to reflect about this, and this is a kind of simple meditation exercise that we do, is imagine a challenging situation that has happened recently in your life. Bring it into your mind 
and simply envision what your response to that situation might be if you had a completely different set of beliefs and expectations um, going into that situation. Huh. Can you imagine how you might respond differently if you had a different set of beliefs and expectations? And, and that's simply a way to get to make this a little looser, if you will. Um, we are so fused with the beliefs and expectations that we have of ourselves. Many people don't even recognize that they have beliefs and expectations. Wait, can, can we just, can we slow this down just for a second? Because, so I thought of a situation, I'm not going to go into too much detail. I thought of a situation where someone hurt my feelings and they did something that I think is wrong, you know, uh, unethical, like really wrong. So I'm trying to imagine, like, I have, I'm thinking of a friend of mine who happens to be a, a, I would consider a pretty enlightened person. She was raised in a Buddhist community and she's very chill. If this happened to her, she would have had a totally different reaction. I mean, it's not to say that she wouldn't be hurt, but is is that the kind of example we're talking about? Yeah, that that's a, I think that's a very appropriate example. Huh. Not because she's Buddhist. I was just happened. I happened to conjure a friend of mine who's like very. She's very like roll with the punches, and I've known her since I'm 11, and I've always been like the high strong one, and she's always been like that's just life. Like everything's fine. Yeah, and also let me just say to make it explicit for listeners that I don't think that this quality it belongs. Uh, in a privileged way to any specific religion. Sure. I think it's accessible. It, it is part of totally. human nature. Yeah. So, but yeah, that's the kind of thing that that um, I think is the case. And this idea of uh, this narrative that we have, we all have a narrative about ourselves. Um, many people don't recognize that they have a narrative. And there are some people that recognize that they have a narrative, but they, they, regarded as a kind of fixed quality of themselves. They don't recognize that the narrative can shift. And really what's key to well-being, let me just say one thing here, is not so much changing the narrative at the beginning, but it's changing our relationship to the narrative so that we can see the narrative for what it is that it, it is a narrative. And it could be different. Uh, and uh, it, it's a constellation of thoughts. And thoughts are thoughts. They're ephemeral. They come and go. And, uh, uh, and having that deep understanding is really helpful in loosening the grip, loosening the extent to which this narrative really hijacks our perception. Okay, so this is where my, uh, yes and, this is where my brain went. This is literally what I thought as you were saying that. I was like, but he doesn't know my family. And I'm not saying that just to be funny, but I literally, you know, I, I, I wasn't planning on going kind of back to that trauma place, you know, but I think of, um, you know, I, I think of a lot of us who have intergenerational trauma. I think of um, a lot of the ways that, that, that many of us are are raised and you know hurt people hurt and many of us come from from parents who who were processing what their parents were processing et, et cetera et cetera you can tell by the way i talk that i'm from a particular part of uh, <laughs> the universe where there's a lot of this and you know what what the the hope is you know is that you know it's not the 1940s it's not even the 1970s. Like we are in a different, we're in a different age, right? I'm doing different as best as I can. I'm sure my children will have what to say. But, you know, the another aspect of the work that you've done is to create a curriculum. And also, you know, there's a, an, an app that is free, which is like uh, unbelievable, where people can begin to to access these things in ways that they can make it their own. Because just the notion that I think so many people walk around, even in this day and age, and I live in Los Angeles, you know, a place where people love to talk about this over smoothies, right? But the notion of truly understanding what you came from, where you're going, you know, how your 
psychological being it is impacting every relationship that you have, right? The the notion that this is something that can be taught to young people. Like, that's what we need to do, correct? And I mean, some schools are starting to already implement this, even in elementary school. Um, you know, mostly when I try and have my kids participate in meditation, like they laugh, they get bored, they don't know why we're doing it. But this aspect of insight, what does that look like to teach it to kids? And I don't just mean kids in wealthy private schools. What does this look like for every human being as their right to understand their inner world? What does that look like? How do you teach that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, first, there are a lot of uh, wonderful issues that you raised. And um, uh, 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 and so we... I'm not sure where to start. With young people, um, we, we've we developed a kindness curriculum which teaches some aspects of this. It's starting in preschool with kids four and five years old. The kindness curriculum, by the way, is freely available on our website in both English and Spanish. Anyone can download it. Um, uh, the, uh, you know, there's been essentially really no work on the development of insight. Um, uh, we don't know at what age it really would be appropriate to start teaching this. My own conjecture is probably around adolescence mm. uh, would be the appropriate time to begin to, to teach this. And I think the, um, the way in which this might be taught to adolescents might look really different than the way we think about meditation. It does, you know, meditation doesn't require that you sit. It doesn't <laughs> require that you sit in any specific posture. Meditation can be done anytime, anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so it may look completely different in uh, uh, an adolescent being taught these kinds of insight um, practices. Uh, uh, and so it may be in the form of a dialogue. Mm. Uh, that they have with a peer, uh, where they're asked to take the perspective of another uh, uh, as a way to cultivate this appreciation for how our beliefs and expectations affect our perception of others. So th there's another point that you made, though, which uh, I feel obligated to comment on, and um, just about your own history, you know, and the history of any family is going to be fraught with, you know, a lot of complexity and there's trauma uh, in so many different places. And you're absolutely right. I mean, there's a huge amount of, of really good neuroscientific evidence on this now that there is, there, there is a reality of the intergenerational sure. transmission of trauma. There's also a reality of the intergenerational transmission of resilience, of the intergenerational transmission of awakening. Uh, the, because the very same mechanisms that are responsible for trauma, as we said before, are also responsible for, um, for well-being and for flourishing. And so we can harness those mechanisms. And people will start off at different baselines because of their trauma history. But every human being has innately the capacity for these qualities. And in fact, you know, I talk about the fact that we are born to be kind. And to some people, that may sound nuts in the kind of world in which we live. But the data are very clear. If you look in young infants and you look at their propensity for warm-hearted pro-social interactions compared to interactions that are selfish and aggressive, the data are very clear. And it's not like 55% of infants prefer the pro-social and 45% prefer the other. It's like 95%. Um, you know, depending on the study, it's between 90 and 100 percent. This is something that we come into the world with. And so when we sit down or more actively meditate and cultivate these qualities, we're not cultivating them from scratch. We're not trying to create something de novo, but rather we're familiarizing ourselves with the basic nature of our own minds. That's really beautiful. And and. You know, when I think about, I mean, it it really, it, it touched my heart and Valerie also, I think we both welled up a little bit. You know, that notion that our, that our default state 
is one of openness, right? Kindness, love, connection. I mean, we're we're mammals, right? That's like nurturing and attachment. Like that's what we do. And I thought of two groups of people who seek to tap into this, people who have a deep connection with a power greater than themselves. And I'm not saying that religious people have it all figured out. But for me, as a person of faith, especially when I connect musically in in a faithful, mindful way, that notion that I am connected to something that has as its core an, an element of goodness, and this is a human word, you know, uh, God doesn't have good, bad, you know, it just is. Um, and, you know, certain aspects of monotheistic religions, Christianity, you know, have, have really have really honed in on that notion of salvation and goodness. So I'm even leaving that aside, but just being in touch with something that feels like, oh, that's my purpose, is goodness, is kindness, is openness. The other group of people I think about are people who have had transcendental experiences, either through intense meditative practice, often with fasting and sometimes chanting, and also people who have experienced, you know, often with completely safe physician-supervised psilocybin or ketamine. Um, there are people who report that in transcendental states, they are experiencing a source of love and wholeness and goodness. And I have to believe that these things are not, you know, they're not disparate. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And I think that... Uh... This is something that every human being has access to, and it's really part of who we are. And uh, uh, love is a more fundamental part of our nature than is hate. Mm. Uh, I think we need to learn to hate, but love is innate. You had the the opportunity to meet uh, the Dalai Lama in 1992, I believe. And this led to a, a really fascinating aspect of research of scanning, correct? Scanning monks. I need to know about this. Like, I have so many dumb questions. Like, like, where did you scan them? Did they come here? Were they living here? What did they wear? Like, did you have to provide certain food? What was that sort of research protocol like? Yeah, great questions. Uh, I mean, over the years, we've probably scanned at least uh, 75 monks. Um, uh, and uh, most of them live in Asia, mm -hmm. uh, in India and Nepal primarily. Uh, and so when we were doing those studies, we would fly the monks over from Asia to uh, wow. Madison, Wisconsin, <laughs> and they would, uh, they would spend about a week with us typically. Uh, and, um, you know, they wore monk's robes. <laughs> the, so that's, uh, and, you know, they came into our laboratory. They used the scanner that they were in the scanner that we have in the lab. And uh, that's, uh, that's what we did. Um, and we fed them food that they enjoyed eating. Uh, did they get like a know? coupon to Starbucks? Like when you participate in a scanning study, you get like a... Yes. <laughs> Some of them like uh, like lattes, uh, you know. It's uh, these are. Uh, I mean, all the monks that we had the opportunity to scan, have, for the most part, are monks that uh, are familiar with the West. Mm -hmm. They've they've been to the West before. They many of them are teachers. Mm -hmm. Some of them are famous teachers uh, uh, who um, uh, you know have are quite well known. Have published books in. Uh, in English that are uh, well-known books. Uh, and so some of these are, you know, some of the most famous living meditation teachers. And um, can you talk a little bit about sort of what you looked at in this particular, you know, population? Were you asking them to actively meditate? Were you asking them to think about other things? Um, what, what what were you kind of looking at? Was this well-being can be measured? That's a quote of yours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we were looking uh, at many different aspects of their brain and their body um, in these studies. Uh, we would record brain electrical activity. We would also have them in the MRI scanner, hmm. looking at both the structure and the function of the brain. We did have them actively meditate. Uh, a, uh, a good portion of the studies was uh, focused on 
discovering what changes in the brain occurred during meditation per se, mm. during formal meditation, but we also were looking at how their brains were different at baseline compared to age and gender match controls. But that, you know, those findings are findings that have all these possible alternative explanations that we mm -hmm. talked about earlier sure. because of the many ways in which these people are different. But, you know, you asked sort of, you know, how we did that and what some of the practical details are. Let me just share one story uh, because it captures this. So um, we, most of the time we had them stay in a hotel that's just adjacent to the campus and walking distance from the lab. So they Wait, can... I have to ask, did you bring them in winter? Because I have seen Wisconsin in the winter. Ro yeah. Robes are not enough for that winter. They, we had them here in the winter <laughs> and, uh, you know, they wrapped themselves That's in scarves. And, uh, so, uh, yeah, in, in, in at least one case, I went out and bought someone a pair of gloves <laughs> um, because he didn't have any gloves. And I, Felt it was not appropriate for him not to be wearing gloves. <laughs> Many of them stayed at this hotel that was just on the edge of campus, and they walked to the lab from there. And so we had one of these monks in for a week, uh, and uh, he left. And the day after he left, I got a call from the manager of the hotel. And the call uh, was, um, you know, initially taken by an assistant of mine and you know, she said that the manager is calling me and I thought that, you know, there's probably some administrative screw up. The bills got, you know, um, uh, didn't get paid or something. Oh, I assume somebody threw a television through a wall. You made them unmonk with your research. So what happened was they were calling me to thank me for the wonderful guests that we're having stay in this hotel. And he said to me that this guy was so friendly and he we, he got comments from the, uh, from the uh, housekeeping staff, <laughs> the front desk staff, and the, kid, the um, restaurant staff, all of whom were just talking about what an incredible person this was. <laughs> that is one of the best unobtrusive measures of uh, kindness that we that we have. You co-authored The Emotional Life of Your Brain, uh, which came out in 2012, and um, it talks about emotional style. And um, we had Susan David on, and a lot of a lot of her work kind of resonated with with when I was learning about um, about this work of yours. And the notion that we all have like an emotional fingerprint, meaning there are different kind of um, unique components of many different aspects that sort of make up uh, how we function and operate emotionally. Um, you, you discuss resilience, outlook, social intuition, self-awareness, sensitivity to context and attention. And I guess where we fall on all of these continuums sort of determines our emotional fingerprint. Can you talk a little bit about sort of the structure of this concept, you know, of emotional style. And also, can these things change too? Yeah, so the great question. So the Emotional Life of Your Brain book and the uh, framework for six emotional styles was uh, um, an inductive process, if you will, that uh, I came to after 30 years of research looking at these different ways in which people respond to emotional challenges. And mm -hmm. so this really was the question that I began my career with and in many ways still is vibrant in our work. And the question can be simply phrased as, uh, why is it that some people uh, uh, respond to emotional challenges uh, with resilience and others respond to these challenges um, with vulnerability, if you will? Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, uh, what accounts for these variations in how people respond? Mm. And so any two people will respond differently to a challenge. And uh, this is really the stuff of emotional styles and, um, uh, and how we think about it. And so after doing this research, uh, we, we came up with these, these six styles that really capture the space of how people respond differently. And some of them are 
you know, pretty intuitive and seem, um, you know, pretty clear and reasonable. Others, I think, are surprising to most people because they're a little bit unorthodox and uh, uh, out of the box. So, for example, one of them is sensitivity to context. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. And um, and so we were led to that by thinking about um, some of the fundamental differences in people who have post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm. Um, uh, and so when you think about people who have post-traumatic stress disorder, one way to think about them is that they are displaying emotions which would be appropriate for certain contexts, mm. but they're displaying those emotions in contexts that are safe and inappropriate. Hmm. So um, in response to a traumatic event, the emotions that they experience may be actually adaptive mm -hmm. for that immediate traumatic event. But then when those emotions continue and they are displayed in safe contexts, that's where the problems arise. So to give a kind of concrete example, someone might be a veteran who comes back from a war zone may be walking in his neighborhood and here's an ambulance. Mm -hmm. Here's an ambulance siren. And that triggers off a panic attack because of all the associations. Mm -hmm. And um, what we would say is that the fundamental difference there is that that individual is not uh, taking into account the context. The context here is it's a safe neighborhood mm. and, you know, it's an ambulance going by. Uh, and the failure to uh, encode that context is leading to a response which may be adaptive in the original traumatic context, but is no longer adaptive. And that, you know, is, is an example of a, a type of emotional style, and it's rooted in a specific brain system. In that case, it really is primarily the hippocampus. Right. And we know that the hippocampus is, it's an area that's really important for memory and particularly for emotional memory, uh, at least in certain parts of the hippocampus. And we know that that's a area of the brain that is specifically um, uh, exhibits certain kinds of abnormalities in people with PTSD. It's interesting that you, that you kind of pulled out sensitivity to context, you know, um, I, I actually, you know, instantly was wondering about, you know, people who may not even be operating from a place of of trauma or or PTSD. But, you know, I was thinking about when when people date, right, or when you meet people that you're going to spend extended periods of time with, there are people who are e exceedingly sensitive to things that other people are not. So I'll I'll take Jonathan for an example because he's not here. You know, he once reported to me that his feet felt very hot and like he couldn't, like we were playing pickleball or something, we were playing basketball. And I was like, your feet are hot? What does that even mean? And he said, well, what what do you mean? What do I mean? Like my, my feet are hot. Don't your feet get hot sometimes? And I said, I don't know if my feet have ever been hot, like in my life. And I gave him such a hard time about it. And then I was at another time. Not long after that, I was playing basketball with my younger son, who is exceptional in many ways. And we were playing for a few minutes. And he said, Mama, he must have been 13 at the time. He said, I can't play. My feet are so hot. <laughs> and I remembered saying, well, I shouldn't have given Jonathan such a hard time because my younger son is a really good reporter of, of, of somatic things. And often they're they're not always connected to emotional states. But I thought, oh my gosh, like, I don't know if I'm not sensitive enough, right? If he's too sensitive. And I was just thinking, like, with your child, obviously, I was like, okay, we'll stop playing basketball. But I was thinking about how many times, you know, especially in dating context or in friend context, where it feels like there's a, a mismatch in this particular arena. But I wonder, and this might be outside of the scope of sort of emotional styles, are there ways to predict, do you think? Who would be a good match based on these continue? I don't know what the plural is of continuum. Con continuum? Continue. Continua. <laughs> Continua. <No. laughs> Touche. Um, yeah, it's a great question. And the honest answer is we don't know. Yeah. Um, you know, it would be super cool to look at that and uh, 
I can picture successful relationships going both ways. That is where there's a sort of mating, so to speak, <laughs> two people who are similar <laughs> coming together. But I also can picture complementary mating right. where people who really are different <laughs> come together and uh uh, the sum is greater than the whole of its well, the, or or the, the one, whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Or one person can hold for the other one whose feet are it's, so hot. <laughs> yes. Can I ask you one final question? Sure. What is your personal meditation practice? Well, my personal meditation practice has evolved over the years. You know, I've been meditating pretty much daily since uh, 1974. Wow. Uh, <clears throat> and in the early days of my practice, uh, I was practicing in the Theravadan tradition, doing a lot of, of Vipassana mm -hmm. kind of practice. Uh, and then in the last 15 years, I've been practicing in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, one of the monks that we studied uh, is Mingyur Rinpoche. And um, I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's written the book called Joy of Living, uh -huh. which... I think is probably the best book on meditation that's ever been written. Huh. Um, and uh, he is my meditation teacher. Wow. So. Um, okay, wait, now I have a, a couple small follow-up questions. Hold on. Could you meditate in an MRI scanner if hard pressed? Sure. You, like sure. not even I a could. question. You could like, that's uh, easy. Yeah, I've done it many times. What? I mean, I can barely stay, I can barely stay unsedated in a scanner. And I, I was trained, I was trained as an undergrad. I trained in fMRI. Uh, that was what my, my undergraduate research. Yeah. But um, it's funny because I was, um, I was in Shavasana uh, at the end of a, a yoga class the other day. And my favorite, favorite yoga teacher who also does kirtan and he does a lot of chanting and uh, another class got out and there was a lot of talking in the hallway. And, you know, I instantly was like pulled out of whatever I was trying to not be pulled out of. And he, in a very, very calm voice, uh, his name's Zach, shout out. I don't know if he listens to this podcast or knows who I am. Uh, but he said, try and imagine that you cannot even understand language. And I was like, that's all I needed to hear. And I can't say that I was able to kind of bring myself back completely, but just that notion of like it, it just, you need to just let it wash over you, which is really what we need to do with all the negative thoughts and judgments that come when we meditate. Is that what it's like trying to meditate in a very loud MRI scanner? Yeah, I think that's a great, and I think his, uh, that little tip is great. I, you know, think it's very uh, insightful and, um, uh, uh, and yes, I think that that is, you, I mean, Minger and Pache talks about this a lot. You could do sound meditation. So mm. rather than uh, um, than sort of feeling, wow, this is a big distraction and it's, quote, pulling me out, mm. make friends with it. Mm. Uh, and uh, making friends with it is simply to, uh, um, you know, any anything could be used to support our awareness. Even pain, even noise, even trauma, even destruction. Exactly. And actually, I'm writing a book now with Mingyur Rinpoche and oh. another scientist called Turning Poison into Medicine. <gasps> At least that's the tentative title. That's incredible. That's the story of my life, Richie. Um, <laughs> okay, wait. I, had, I, I did have one more question. What happened in 1974 that you got turned on to this kind of universe? Were you already in med school? I'm trying to do the math. Uh, well, I wasn't in med school. I was in graduate school. Okay. I, I have, yeah. Oh, you have so, the, you have the other degree. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. <laughs> um, just as you do. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I was in, I just finished my second year of graduate school at Harvard in psychology. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I was very fortunate to be, or meet some people who were like, just, super amazing people. They were mm. warm-hearted. They, uh, they just had this secret sauce that I mm. wanted to learn more about and wanted some of. Mm. Uh, and I learned that these were all people who had uh, uh, a practice of meditation. And, wow. um, and they were people that I met outside the academy. Mm. Uh, and, uh, uh, and although they had some connection to the academy, 
Uh, one of those people, by the way, was Ramdas. I don't know if you oh, know who he of co- is. Of course. Please, Richie. Yeah. Please. Okay. So Ram, <laughs> Ramdas was one of my first teachers. Uh, wow, 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 uh, wow. And he was hanging around in Cambridge, Massachusetts in those days. He had just come back from his first extended stay in India. Amazing. And I literally met him the very first day of graduate school. Wow. Uh, um, uh, and so that was like uh, a mind-blowing experience. No, and that's absolutely. So he told me I should go to to Asia and um, get a taste of this uh, more deeply. So wow. it took a couple of years, but I went after my second year of graduate school. And where were you raised? New York City. Oh, Manhattan proper. Got it. Oh, Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Oh, Brooklyn. Got it. My parents are from the Bronx, so. It's really been a pleasure talking to you. Um, and um, I just, again, I have such great respect for for so much of your work and and really how you've been able to to tackle so many different aspects of, you know, true wellness um, in a way that's just really so entertaining to talk to you about. Um, and it really just is such a pleasure. Um, so thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you so much. And I really appreciate your great questions and uh, all that you're doing to bring this work out into the world. So thank you. It's Maya Bialik's Breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. She's got a neuroscience PhD or two. One fiction, one fiction. And now she's going to break down. 